start with our top story coming out of China, where the number of people who have died from the coronavirus has risen to 80. Officials now th say they are 2,700 infected and nearly 6,000 suspected cases nationwide, with over 30,000 people under observation. The disease could spread further after the mayor of Wuhan said nearly 5 million residents left the city before it was closed. There are more than 11 million permanent residents in Wuhan, of whom more than 9.9 .9 million are registered population. The floating population in Wuhan is nearly 5 million. During the spring festival holiday, nearly 5 million people left Wuhan because of the festival or the epidemic. China's Hainan province has confirmed its first fatality, an 80-year-old woman. Beijing has imposed limits on transport around China to contain the outbreak. In the meantime, Hong Kong has stopped residents of Hubei province from entering the territory. The Lunar New Year national holidays have been extended up to February the 2nd to delay people's return to work. With the disease spreading globally, WHO chief Tedros Ghebreyesus is heading to Beijing to meet Chinese officials. Australia has confirmed its fifth case of the virus, a 21-year-old woman who was on the last flight out of Wuhan. French Prime Minister Edouard Philippe has called on an emergency meeting with ministers to discuss the epidemic. France has already confirmed three cases of the virus, the first in Europe. In Iraq, five rockets have landed in and around the U.S. Embassy in the heavily fortified Baghdad Green Zone. It was the third such attack on the U.S. Embassy this month, but it is the first time the complex has been hit directly. The U.S. Joint Operations Command says the rockets fell into a riverbank without causing any injuries. However, witnesses claim injuries are feared, as one rocket hit the consulate cafeteria, while two others landed at a short distance. None of the attacks have been claimed, but Washington has repeatedly blamed Iran-backed military factions. The U.S. State Department has called on Iraq to fulfill its obligations to protect Washington's diplomatic facilities. The Iraqi Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi has condemned the attack, calling it an aggression that can drag Iraq into war. Palestine says there will be riots and protests in the West Bank when U.S. President Donald Trump presents his Middle East peace plan. In a statement, President Mahmoud Abbas said the deal would not pass without Palestinians' consent. Palestinian officials have threatened to withdraw from key provisions of the Oslo Accords if the peace plan is presented next week. The Palestinian Foreign Ministry has called for a clear international declaration rejecting the so-called deal of the century. It said the scheme risks endangering regional stability. Chief Palestinian negotiator Saeb Erekat has called the U.S. deal an attempt to destroy the two states. This comes during Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's visit to Washington, where Trump is expected to release the plan before Tuesday. Two Palestinian miners have been shot and injured by Israeli forces with rubber-coated steel bullets in the occupied West Bank. The incident happened after Israeli forces stormed into the town of Beit Omar to the north of Hebron. Rescue officials say Israeli forces stormed an area adjacent to the illegal Israeli settlement of Kermisur, provoking clashes. Oman's Foreign Minister Yusuf bin Alawi has met with his Iranian counterpart Javad Zarif in Tehran for talks on security in the Arabian Gulf. Alawi was making the visit to Tehran on the tail end of his trip to the World Economic Forum in Davos. In a statement, Iran's foreign ministry said Alawi and Zarif discussed bilateral cooperation regarding the Strait of Hormoz. The two sides emphasized their government's will to guarantee maritime and energy security for all. This was their second meeting in Tehran since Tuesday and their fourth encounter since late July. Seven million Indians have rejected the Indian government's discriminatory citizen act by forming a human chain. The 620-kilometer-long chain was formed in the Indian state of Kerala. The state's ruling Left Democratic Front and Civil Society organized the demonstration, which was attended by activists and politicians. Meanwhile, inspired by the protesters of Delhi's Shaheen Bagh, women in large numbers took to the streets of Mumbai. 
protests continued through the wee hours on Monday with women raising slogans like We All Are One and Independence. The similar all-women sit-in continues in Lucknow despite threats of the use of force by the Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister Yogi Adyanath. Remaining in India, over 300 eminent personalities, including actor Nasir Din Shah, have written an open letter against the New Citizenship Act. Other celebrities include Mira Nair, Ratna Patak, Javed Jafri, vocalist T.M. Krishna, author Amitav Ghosh, and historian Romila Tapar. In their letter, the celebrities expressed solidarity with civilians protesting against the controversial law. The letter reads, The soul of the nation has been threatened as the livelihood and statehood of millions is at stake. It says, despite the government's claim, the law does not appear to be benign legislation only meant to shelter the persecuted. Stating that they are ending their silence, the open letter also stated that they will stand with those who stand for democracy. It also criticized police brutality on students at Jamia Millia Islamia and Aligarh Muslim University. In other news, Russia has reportedly concluded the delivery of a second S-400 missile system to China. Russia's military says the handover certificate was signed in China in December. It said the procurement consisted of two divisions of launch devices, radio location stations, and energy and service equipment. It said China also received a 120 advanced anti-aircraft guided missiles. China received its first regimental S-400 set in the spring of 2018. Let's move on to Libya now, where UN-recognized government has claimed Commander Khalifa Haftar has opened a new fighting front in the country's northwestern Misrata city. Officials say Haftar forces are now advancing towards the city, which is allied with the GNA government. Meanwhile, the UN mission in Libya says Tripoli's Matiga airport has been hit by two rockets, wounding two civilians. Fighting resumed a week after Libya's warring sides and the leaders of Russia, Turkey and the West agreed to a truce and an arms embargo at the Berlin conference. The truce has virtually collapsed with renewed fighting and UN reports regarding violations of the embargo. Egypt's Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri has flown to the U.S. for talks on the disputed Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam on the River Nile. In a statement, the Foreign Ministry said Shukri will take part in the U.S.-sponsored ministerial meeting. During the talks, Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia will discuss the filling and operation of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. The ministry said that the meeting will also be attended by representatives of the World Bank, Cairo fears the dam project on the Nile River threatens Egypt's water supply and will harm the environment. However, Sudan eyes future benefits from the dam's construction despite Egyptian concerns. The Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has arrived in Algeria for talks on the Libyan conflict and plans to boost trade links. Algeria state media says the Turkish president was greeted at Algiers airport by his counterpart, Abdelmajid Tebboun. Speaking to media, Erdogan said the two sides discussed defense, military and cultural issues. This is the first visit by a foreign president to Algeria since Tebboun was elected Algerian president in December last year. Algiers has taken a role as mediator and hosted a meeting of Libya's neighbors that rejected any foreign interference last week. After Algeria, Erdogan will visit Gambia and Senegal. I'll be back with plenty more news after this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Britain's fishing industry has suffered from the UK being late to join the European Union in the 1970s. However, since then, fishermen have blamed the EU itself for the decline in their industry, claiming it gave foreign boats generous access to British waters. They hope that Brexit will change that, but there are no guarantees. 
Dawn is still hours away when Davy and his crew set off from North Shields in northeast England, the lights of other fishing boats glint on the horizon, but there are far fewer than when Britain joined the EU in 1973. Davy blames Europe's fish sharing quotas. Boats from the continent now take six times more from UK seas than British boats do from European waters. Our own fleet surely has to come first. When we leave Europe, we've got to be looking at a bigger picture to get a better, sustainable fishing for our own country. Never mind these former lads. Fishing crews like Davies account for less than 0.1% of the UK's economy, but for an island nation like Britain, they're a symbol of independence. The trouble is, once again, we've been, we've been promised and promised, and at the last minute, they'll sell you down the river because they've got no spine, any of them. 25 Most of these fish are exported to Europe, making some wholesalers worry that any trade dispute with the EU could be damaging. On a local level here in North Shields, probably 60% of that would, would go to the European markets predominantly. So without access into those markets, um, it would really hit the industry hard. The EU's trade chief has already suggested fish are up for grabs, saying fishing rights could be the price of British access to European financial markets. In a choice between this tiny industry and the vast city of London, Britain's politicians may sacrifice the economic minnow in a bid to steer the wider economy away from the rocks. Well, the death toll due to record rainfall in southeastern Brazil has jumped to 53. Officials have expressed alarm over continuing storms in the country. Disaster officials say 44 people are dead in the state of Minas Gerais and nine others in neighboring Espirito Santo. They said 19 people are still missing. Nearly 20,000 people were evacuated due to the threat of floods and landslides. Rescuers are struggling as several highways have been cut by floods and scores of bridges have been knocked out. Rainfall in the region has been the heaviest since records were first kept 110 years ago. Well, Pakistan's ongoing economic recovery has helped improve its score in the Economic Freedom Index 2019. A report by the Washington-based Heritage Foundation says the country also scored higher in judicial effectiveness and property rights. It gave Pakistan 55.0 on a scale of 0 to 100, making it the 131st freest economy on a list of 186. It says Pakistan's overall economic freedom score has increased by 0.6 points. The foundation defines economic freedom as the fundamental right of every human to control their labor and property. The Heritage Foundation, with a close link to the Trump administration, has been publishing the index for the last 25 years. Well, Asian stocks are tumbling as investors grow increasingly anxious about the economic impact of China's spreading coronavirus outbreak. Demand for safe haven assets such as the Japanese yen and treasury notes is spiking. The trade in the region has already slowed for the Lunar New Year and other holidays. Financial markets in China, Hong Kong and Australia remain closed. Japan's Nikkei 225 has dived over 2% and is on track for the biggest one-day fall in three weeks. Hong Kong's Hang Seng has plunged almost 3%, while Seoul's Kospi has so far lost 1%. China's Yuan has fallen in offshore trade to its lowest level in three weeks. Time to find out what the weather is like around the world. And with that, you're all caught up. Thank you for watching this, but it's in your own business.